three, two, we are live. This is 2OF Entertainment. here we is yeah so here we can do let's do we want to be let me just see do we want oh that's scary but that's a good scary we'll do that so how you been um doing well yeah no we're okay yeah i'm sorry i didn't mean to ask a tough question to start off the morning <laughs> uh, yeah. something easier yeah, that's a tough question yeah well the weather's in and out so we're we're making our gotcha. way headway into the new summer somewhere along the way nice and uh no you got program stacked up like O'Hara. It's just like going. I, I Can I tell you, it's uh, the, so anybody that knows us and we call it the Hollywood day. Um, but today really is Wednesday. So we today for us, for you, for your show is Hollywood Thursday. Earlier, we did Hollywood Friday, Hollywood Saturday. So, <laughs> um, you know, and and one of the shows that we do, No Snobs or Noms, I actually have to dress for because it's a we do it like a dinner show. So I wear a sports coat, whatever. Next week we're wearing tuxedos for the show. So I've been joking <laughs> with everybody. Next week I may be overly dressed for all your shows. Um, but uh, Wednesday seems to be the crazy day of yeah. shows, and then every other day it's like one or two shows. But Wednesday is literally back to back from like seven in the morning up until about noon. It's just back to back oh. shows. So we try to get them out, which is nice. But, you know, I feel bad because then we're running late for you guys or somebody else. And I'm like, I, I'll be there in a second. I swear to God. So, you know, but we'll get through the it. time change also doesn't help. When the time change goes back, then David can, you know, come in and do a couple of the shows and I don't have to do them all. So it works out well. well we've got the time change in place. He just doesn't have it yet. I know. Gotta, I know. He's just the kindest. That's you're so close to Greenwich Meridian. I don't know why they don't get it first. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It's those, it's those Amsterdam people. They just don't know. They just have no clue. <laughs> no, but but you, you have a fascinating guest today. You know, we've, we've had photographers before. And I think yep. uh, each one is unique in what they do. And Brandomir is a doctor uh, uh, in biology. Um, nice. He's got a degrees uh, like crazy. Uh, I won't get into all the education level. He's got his well-educated man. And uh, how he's picked up a camera and how it is, uh, I guess it's how he crawls around in the grass and the trees in the forest and he talks about the environment and uh, he's got a couple of books so we'll talk about some of the books that he's got out he's published cool and uh yeah he's a he's a very uh, he came to canada from croatia in 1987 and he's educated in uh, a number of our universities and he's got his master's degree and phd and like i said he's nice uh he's very well spoken about our and knowledgeable about our environment he's uh, also a doctor of genetics as well so okay. He knows what's going on, so we're going to maybe try and put these pieces together and figure out how photography fits in uh, in his life. We'll bring him in. Yeah. Cool. And there, and there he is. Brandon Majed Light. Good we'll morning. do this. Oh, did yeah. I brush my hair? Oh, good. Yeah, like, got your hair looks perfect. <laughs> what, what I'm going okay? yeah, yeah. to leave let you two gentlemen just have a wonderful show, and I'll be back at the end to ask my usual standard questions. So enjoy your show and um, knock them dead. Thanks a lot. Talk to you. Cheers. Well, good day to you, sir. Haven't seen you for a while. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah. Have you been been on traveling a bit? Are you moving around? I haven't been a traveling. It's a lot of time um, spent at work and traveling to save the planet. So there is not much time for a fun. No. <laughs> so hopefully, we're taking more courses. Uh, I'm actually learning how to um, set up NGO and then save the planet. So oh, wow. I will you know did, that in mid-April, and then I'll start working on it. You, you didn't pick a big enough project. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, you know, it's. Um, I hope to live for another, what the statistics Canada gives me. Gives me 18 more years, so I have way to go. Well... Yeah, working right out to the very end. I think I think you're just like an artist. An artist works right to the end. I mean, you're yeah. it's really. Uh, but you're you're trained as a biologist, but you really you've picked up this camera. How long ago? Did, where did the camera really become 
uh, major tool for you, like the thing that you really enjoy, this this visual eye that can capture things and our nature and our, uh, I guess, environment. When when did that first start with you, the camera? Well, it started a long time ago when I was a little boy. I'm not going to tell you how long ago, but very, very long ago in the land far, far beyond. <laughs> um, I would say 1718, my parents sent me to Britain um, to study English, to classes there. And um, I picked up the camera just to record things that I saw because it was new and I wanted to share that with, with my friends and my family. When I was at university level, uh, undergraduate, I uh, studied biology and I saw the presentation by quite well-known Croatian photographer, nature photographer, and that got me hooked. So I would say I started photography more seriously at university, so in my early 20s. Um, that hobby kind of went on. And when I came to Canada, it was difficult because I didn't have my family around. I was kind of quite alone. And on the weekends, it was really felt very isolated. So going out in the nature outside and taking pictures was a way of escape for me. So that kind of kept me going. And I'm really glad because it goes both ways. Um, very often when I get out and I'm middle of some absolutely gorgeous area and there's a quiet and you can hear the, the like life around you and beautiful landscapes. And I'm thinking if it were not for photography, I would probably stay at home and read newspapers or watch some stupid TV show, right? <laughs> It is excuse to get out, and it gets me out of the house. Yeah, like yeah. instead of a dog, I have a camera. <laughs> yeah, it might be easier to take care of the camera. Well, I don't know. Cameras can get pretty expensive. Yes, uh, and you don't. Well, advantage you don't have to clean after a camera, unless you drop it. Yeah. Well, they do require some maintenance, I think. But some uh, maintenance, yes. you know, you do have to lug a few lenses around and uh, to get. What so you're now completely digital, correct? You right now I am completely digital, yeah. But okay. lagging camera around is pretty good because when I walk in the field, I have a backpack with gear, a little bit of water and food, and then in one hand I have a camera with a long telephoto lens and a tripod in another. And I can tell you, after a day of walking, you're pretty buffed up. <laughs> yeah. No, it's you are carrying material. Well, <clears throat> something like a plein air photographer or a painter, a plein air painter, you go out and you kind of capture that moment that you happen to be there. But uh, so like I've talked to other photographers. So do you kind of wait for that moment to happen? You can sort of sense when, say, a cloud cover is going to come at the right time or do you just shoot, 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 shoot and then come back? Or do you plan your day a little bit to be at a certain place in the morning or? or in the evening? Do you do you any of that kind of planning or is it just when it happens? I, it happens? I plan my day in terms of time of the day, where to go. Have you heard uh, about a golden hour? Yeah, the golden do hour. Do you know what it is? Can you define golden hour? It's the early morning and it's uh, later just before dusk evening. So it's-, it's No, uh, I think the correct, when you look at the Wikipedia, definition of golden hour is an hour before your kids go to bed <laughs> and you go to bed. <laughs> that's the best time no uh, you're right it is um kind of early morning and late evening maybe just before sunset and maybe a little bit after sunset and now with the digital photography you can stay a little bit longer because um digital cameras are more sensitive to light than we had before with the film especially with slides they don't have very high dynamic range so it's really interesting with digital cameras you can stay longer and capture more detail in that twilight. And that, that edge between light and the dark is most interesting for me, right? So in times of day, and then the concept of edge, a lot of photographers talk about it, not just in a sense of time, but also in a sense of space. For example, when you look at the lake and the boreal forest, when you're in the middle of the boreal forest, you can't see much, right? The trees all around you. When you're in the middle of the lake, you can't see much except maybe a loon or some bird flying in, fish jumping. 
But when you're on that edge between a lake and a forest, that's where the interesting things happen, right? Wow. So think about the edge in terms of space, but also in terms of time. How do I prepare? Um, I prepare I'm in terms of first. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get Stephen to start our first image. So we have something up on the screen here. If he can, there we go. Okay, okay. We'll, we'll we'll continue with your question. Sorry, I'm. Okay, yeah, no, no, we can look at it. So in terms of preparation is uh, look, I live in the prairies here in Saskatchewan, right? So the weather has a very strong impact on what we do. So I actually look at the drought maps and look where is the possibility for vegetation to be green, to be booming. So in the drought years, I do not go a lot to the south because you have very small window when the life is booming and before everything kind of start becomes dormant. So I would spend more time in the boreal forest. And also in terms of the project, um, how I focus my photography is I have a plan in the mind. I want to work on a project and focus on that rather than just kind of aimlessly go around and take pictures. And then when I pick up the area, I look what would be interesting. I look at the Google Maps, look at the contour of the land, I look when you ask me the time of the day in the morning, I would go in the area where the more exposed to the raising sun. And in the afternoons, I would kind of more go in the areas where I thought would be better in the afternoon in terms of the contour of the land and the light direction and the quality. So yeah. that would be kind of fine tuned. Um, and then what I try to do, look at, at Google Maps and then just look at the contours and what would be interesting. Some people, what they do, they do research and they look at the pictures of other photographers to get the idea. But I try not to do that because you could be influenced by others. Um, and then that could maybe sway you and say, well, this is cool. I want to take a picture like that. But then <clears throat> what is really the what your personal contribution or personal creation and in terms of when I say waiting, yes, um, I used to be a bird uh, a bird watcher and photographer, but two things do not match with the birding, with bird watching. You come to the area, you kind of look what there were uh, birds around, you check mark, you saw that bird, you move on. With <laughs> photography, you have to be more patient. And when you ask, do I wait for the clouds to move in? Yes, quite often I wait for the cloud to move in to see, to make a visual balance with the subject on the ground with structure of the sky above. So we have that. With the photographers, it's not like a painter. You cannot, well, you can move the cloud, but I try not, not to do that, right? You cannot put the cloud in. With photography, different from painting, you remove things. So you try to simplify uh, to have the image that is pure essence, what you want to portray. Whereas with, for example, painting, you are adding elements and then you stop, right? So here, when you look at a picture, that is a good example for the elements that I said. Thank you for putting that one on. I don't know what you're reading my mind. It's kind of scary. <laughs> so that was taken minutes after the sunrise. Um, so you have that warm glow where the sun is low on the horizon, the blue spectrum of the light gets filtered. So you get warmer colors, red, yellow, orange. And that is warmer colors really uh, reflect more positive response from the viewer, right? We really like more warmer colors than we prefer cooler colors. So this is the quality of the light. The sun is very low. Here you cannot see, this is kind of a deep shadow there uh, in the grass. So you see that the sun is low, but there is no structure like a grain elevator that you'd really take advantage of low yeah. light. Yeah. Um, there is a fog early in the morning because the ground is still wet and the condensation in the <clears throat> grass. And this was taken at one of Scaving Heritage Park. Yeah. And I was quite lucky that I had this kind of semi Cloudy, stormy cloud was more uniform, and then uh, the the clouds kind of turned darker. Maybe 20 minutes before, it might have been kind of reddish in the clouds, 
But then now you have this again, contrast between warm elements and the cold elements in the sky, right? So you have this difference um, right. in, in tone, in hue, from warm hue to cold hue, which is, again, you're bringing that edge between warm and cold, edge between uh, earth and the sky. And interesting elements with these teepee, uh, teepees structures at Bonuscaving Heritage Park. Yeah. So do you do you uh, adjust any of these on when you get home, like on, on computer at all? Um, I depends on the camera that I use. Every camera will have a slightly different tone that would that would um, portray. So I would when I importing the images in my software, it would automatically kind of adjust to the tone that I prefer. But <clears throat> I don't do a lot of adjustment, mostly kind of um, kind of tone maybe crop a little bit if I if I miss up the horizon so I don't do a lot I would in this case um, if there is any pop can or garbage can I would clone that out I would remove it compared to when I thinking like um, when you think paintings from Robert Bateman he would paint this and then would he would put little you know what I say elements of man right that'll be beer bottle or something in the corner there, the message, the artist mm. message that we have impact on the environment. Right. I don't do that. I do remove, if there is any pop can or a beer bottle, I would remove it. Yeah. But mm. I would not remove it to the extent to change what is there, right? Because it's that beer bottle is there but it's not part of the environment and something that came from the outside so that would be manipulation it would not be kind of documentary image as a journalist would do journalists are not allowed to modify but as an artist as a photographer you're actually interpreting the scene what you see exactly i kind of when i see the scene i have taken pictures for so long that i can pre-visualize what I wanted to do. Um, so it's already at the moment of taking pictures, um, I would photograph what I see. And it's really interesting. For example, I would come in, I would see something and take a picture of two, and then I would work it, try to improve it. But very often for my personal taste, the first two or three pictures, or maybe the first one is the best one because this is what attracted me in the first place. And yeah. that's for me personally, emotionally, I can connect with that image rather yeah. than trying 10 images more to improve it because you're really forcing it. It's, it's not it. Right. So, um, yeah, you get, yeah, you get different feelings from that. You but, get a different feeling. Yeah. And in terms of composition that they say the best tool for composition are your legs, right? You have to move around and see what is the best perspective. Yeah. to create an image right um, yeah I think with, uh, with with painting it's uh you, you you have you'll be sitting out paint you're lucky to get your image down in 20 minutes you you have a kind of a gestural moment of and you got to try because the light changes so fast and yes paint for a long time in one spot you'll never finish your painting because the shadows continually move uh, and what you're doing. So you have to capture that in your mind. And I think photography can be like that. You're fortunate in a way, because when you click the shutter, it's done. Like, then you have to move on to the next image. Where yeah. photographer, unfortunately, a, photo a lot of photographers have their phones out and they take a photo of the image and they, they refer back to it later if they've strayed, I guess they'll call it. But now they're back following an image again and I guess replicating it. Uh, in paint, uh, but I see, I mean, these ones are beautiful. This again is a, uh, it's so subtle and it really gives a feeling of the geology of, of our, I guess, of our province. Um, if people think of Saskatchewan as flat, they are very, very uh, misled by uh, anybody who's telling them that because we have geology from the south to the north, that is extreme 
short of a mountain. That's about it. But we have some major, major hills. And um, where is this area? Where this this area? So what you're looking now is um, property. Nature Conservancy of Canada has a conservation property southwest of East End. This is called Old Man on His Back. And this is actually glacial moraine system. There are deposits from the glaciers. We are looking north. Um, so that is a view of north end of the Pro NCC property. This was taken uh, before sunrise. So I have that twilight. And a friend kind of commented that take a lot of lavender landscapes because that light um, that is before the sunrise, right? You have this really warm glow. And what is interesting when the people look out, the photographers or painters, when you look at the sunrise or sunset, we tend to look right into the sun because we see those gorgeous red clouds. But quite often, I would urge that you turn around 180 degrees and look behind you because very often you will have that um, a glow, a sky glow that you see 180 degrees from the sun. And that was the case yeah. here yeah. where we are kind of looking north, northwest. Um, and then I remember many years ago when we used to hang out, um, you mentioned that you like November or oh, November. November, November skies, because of that, that transition of the season, again, the edge going from the fall into the winter, right? There is a, something about the angle of the sun in November and in March, April, where you get more of those beautiful lavender skies. Uh, yeah. You can explain that more because yeah. you commented <laughs> that. I can, I can, I just, but I think it's, uh, it's subtle, but it, it it it's it's a beautiful contrast with the greens. I mean, you you and you don't get them in such a short time. You get that. Yes, uh, it lasts. Where I missed so many photographs by fumbling with my camera because it can last only two or three minutes, and if you're not there, uh, you yeah. can miss it. Yeah. No, it's. Uh, we'll, we'll go on a couple of images here. Let me see another one. I I you know he sent me this one, and I'm looking. This is a very, and I'm going. Did he shoot this thing through a nylon stocking or did he, how did he get that soft focus? Like, it's just beautiful. It feels like brush strokes. I mean, I, and I, I do that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll draw interest back to painting and how, but this is very painterly. This, this piece is very. Yes, painterly. exactly. And that's what I wanted to do. Um, there is actually, I was in Montana uh, photographing sage grouse and then once you're done with you have to do it like come there before the sunrise and then the rest of the day you travel around and take a picture so I saw this scene that was very simple and what I wanted to do I had the long lens um, 500 millimeter and it's on a gimbal that allows you very smooth movement and balanced movement of the lens so what I did with the long telephoto lens, I set up my camera to a slightly longer exposure, maybe half a second. And then I moved the camera, camera in vertical direction too. So this is done with a camera movement. And then I was taking picture after picture after picture until I got the effect that I wanted. And with digital camera, it's easier because you can immediately see on the screen what you got. So this yeah. was intentional movement of the camera with the long lens, just focusing on a small segment of the landscape. Yeah, and moving it vertically because all the elements are vertical makes yes, it's not it's not the blurred left and right image, which would be really hard to look at. Uh, well, it would yeah. be for yeah. focusing your eye. This one still leaves the light running up the side of the tree. It still leaves. The shadows in the same but yeah. vertically so you still know what it is without kind of looking through a, a shower glass that was kind of blurry yeah. like that so yeah. it, it it i think it was the right movement for for what you're doing like a vertical movement and it, uh, i think it you know it just has a it had it's really different than some of the other things but i like that you take chances like you yeah you try, 
And you know, a lot of these come about because say it's a boring day and you go, it's the yeah, light. Heck, what do you do? The yeah. light is flat or I've got what I want and I still have some time. What do I do? And I found it's sort of like leaving. I got at the end of the day, I have a bunch of paint left on my palette. I said, well, I'm yeah. going to either scrape it in the garbage uh, and start tomorrow with a new palette or I'm just going to use it. And that's usually, I find, you know, not every time, but a lot of times you you rediscover something because you're looser and it's you, you don't care if something happens. And I think maybe digital camera has done some of that with people too. You're not having to pay for the development of it, each film slide. Um, you can shoot hundreds of images instead of one, you know, every one, every 36 images, you got to get a new roll of film uh, True. In, in a lot of those cases. So I think it has loosened photographers up to take chances uh, more. But, but uh, very often you have the attitude, oh, I'll fix that later in the Photoshop. <laughs> yeah, no, try yeah. to do it the best in the camera. And then you just slight adjustments. I mean, you could do this movement in in software, right? You could kind of blur it, yeah. get a motion blur or direction, but I did it in the camera. And then, too, this was done in early spring in March. So you have, again, a, a border of the seasons, winter in the spring, and now it's really interesting because you have a simple color, so that's still dry grass, and the trees are not covered in leaves. So you see the structure of tree trunks. And then, like here in Saskatoon, I'm looking forward to getting less muddy and wet snow. But right now, when you have this simple landscape, but you have this uh, red uh, dogwood, right, with the uh, uh, red branches, yeah. they would really stand out in yeah. um in this kind of a landscape yeah. before the leaves come out right so there's always something that you that that you can look and never stop looking like don't pack your camera just continue looking and then you'll find new things you'll, you'll find stuff yeah yeah the yes. red will the red willow actually is quite red in the winter time it's it it, it emits uh i guess uh there's a something inside it that so it doesn't freeze and basically, it it stays very pliable in the winter time, and the red yes, yeah. and it adds a real nice shot of color uh, against yeah. snow. And uh, you know, if you get a little bit of ochre grass showing through it, it you know things that you can actually get quite a bit of color in the winter time. And let everybody know that Brandemir he shot this large image that I use as my background, and I appreciate that very much. Of, uh, oh yeah, dating yeah. uh, out at in, I think it was. Uh, or was that Waska Sioux or someplace? That like was that. in Waska Sioux. Yeah, I was with a friend who had the red jacket on. So I had a little splash of color. But what I did, I put a flashlight. Somebody created the um, ice kind of um, ice fishing shack out of ice blocks. So what I did, I put a flash with a bit of red filter on it and then remotely triggered it. So it brings a little bit of light from the inside. And the, again, you have this contract between warm light of the flash and completely cool ice and skies around. And again, you get a little of interest to splash your human figure that fortunately had the red jacket. Yeah. I, I didn't buy it for her. I advise people to come go to his website and you can see the actual image on his site as well. I have it in the background. We're not going to switch pictures in, around here, but we're going to stay with his, his photography. I, I like this one with, you know, just with that human element in this one, just a little touch of human element. Uh, yeah. And uh, you do feel like you're on the edge of the world on this one. This one feels like there's there's either Armageddon going to just happen somewhere. <laughs> or the or you can kind of stand and contemplate, like, what is the meaning of the world, right? What is the meaning of life? <laughs> Well, that it's is, got universality to it. That's what I like. Yes. I mean, this yeah, could be it has a message. You can interpret it in very a lot of ways. This was photographed in Florida. Uh, it was sunset, I believe. Yeah, it was a sunset late in, in the after evening. I took a longer exposure to blur the water a little bit. So you can have a sense there are waves, but you don't see them. And that actually, I did take this picture because of the message that it can conveys. And then try to incorporate kind of a human figure because in a lot of that communication, the storytelling is you want to 
kind of present and and entice the viewer to think i wish i was there right what would i do how would i feel if i was in this place at that time instead of that person who was on the beach yeah so how much of your work is really kind of centering on our environment and awareness and trying to get people to become more aware um, of their presence i guess and how much they can uh, they are affecting i guess our planet you know and what else can they do to i guess better themselves yeah. and better what we're doing i do i am kind of an environmental photographer and then i uh take a pictures of birds and the bees first of all it's aesthetically i love that because as a biologist i feel connected understanding as an environmentalist, then again, it is you portray a lot of things that other people are not able to see or don't have time to see or they're not interested in seeing. So you're portraying some of the things that people become more aware. And if they're aware, hopefully they will care more about it, right? Yeah. Um, at the beginning, like you, when you're a member of camera clubs, they say, oh, you cannot see evidence of man or a woman or person right so you try to exclude everything that is connected with humanity but i think like humanity is it, you cannot differentiate be, between humanity and the natural world because we are part of the natural world and we have a huge impact on the natural world so that's what i try to do not only kind of a pretty pictures but our connection with the environment and when i'm telling the stories i have to force myself too to tell the stories about people um in the two books that you mentioned i have two books published about the prairies so i on purpose i try to go out and then take pictures of people who are living and working in nature in natural environment so i did a lot of work with the ranching community because they have really direct connection with environment in the sense that is not uh, intensively extractive, right? You do manage, you don't, you don't basically raise cows, you raise grass, right? You manage the grass with the grazing and that managed grass provides habitat and a home for a lot of plant and animal species, right? right? So there is that connection with the human influence on the nature, but also human connection to the nature. I didn't include a lot of uh, uh, pictures with people in the selection because I thought maybe it would be more in terms of kind of art and painting some of the images to you would be interested in. Yeah, well, we're, we're interested in lots of images. So I know a lot of your images are, uh, you. Um, they're very long landscapes, long and narrow, horizontals, and they're beautiful. They, they don't quite fit our format, but we can, we'll think about something and figure out a way of maybe when, if we come back again, we can look at a different way of looking at how photography is, is, is representing, uh, you know, our environmental issues that we're talking about. But mm -hmm. today we'll just go through and look, I, I just like to look and see your work and see how you're feeling about things. This is a beautiful piece of uh birch actually they're probably aspen trees are probably yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> see okay the previous image that you showed was that vertical movement of the lens this is not movement of the lens it's a movement of the subject so it was photographed in prince albert national park and there were occasional gusts of wind so I kind of look at it and say, like, what can I do to really portray the forest in a different way that you that we see? And I love that in the fall when you have the aspen trees with a, a white, very clear um, bark and then surrounded by the yellows and reds of the fall. So in this case, I noticed that with the gusts of wind, the leaves are moving but the trees are relatively stationary. So what I did, I put a polarizing filter to reduce the amount of light, kind of saturate the color from the leaves. And then I set up my camera to take a long exposure. So, and then I waited until the gust of leaves, a gust of wind was moving the leaves in the background. It did move the trees a little bit, but not enough to be recorded on the camera. And then I just, 
took several images until I got what I wanted, yeah. right? So this is intentional movement, but the movement of your subject. Yeah. No, rather than the camera. See that. Yeah. It it really focuses, um, it changes this, you've got this beautiful yellow green field of color in the background and the, the trees just pop off the page. It's just beautiful, these two, especially the two front ones. They, two trees, yeah. Anyway, we're, we'll move along. We got lots of images to go through here. Yeah, so we just think. So you, you talk about the uh, influences man has on the environment and how you, you you put, I guess, put us in the landscape a little bit. Now this is an error shot from, good lord, you know, those that truck's been there for a while, I think. But it, it's uh, you know the antique trucks and farms and farmyards and all these buildings are disappearing. They're going back to earth. You can you can you can see it's happening. Uh, where is this located? This one. This is on. Um... So that was near Avon Lee, in one of the community edge of one of the community pastures. I took this when I was working on on the second book of the Islands of Grass and Community Pastures, Saskatchewan. Uh, here again, can you see the a bit of historical photograph? Those, those barns. I don't know whether they are used anymore, and then you said abandoned vehicle here. So what attracted me to this this image or this scene was again these warm colors, and, and again um, I was pretty lucky with the storm clouds behind, and then actually those clouds kind of form a V shape pointing right down to the truck. So I moved around a little bit left and right until I got line up those compositional elements and uh, took a picture. It was a long exposure. You can see the sage um, bush over yeah. there is moving a little bit because it was a gust of wind. But again, what attracted me to that was that contrast of the dramatic sky, but complemented, it, it's contrasted with this uh, smooth and relatively warm colors, ochre colors and darkest brown mm -hmm. colors of the rusty vehicles and the barn in the background, right? Again, yeah. this contrast between elements in the image yeah no it's, it's good it's it's a uh, it's a good sourcing of design on the fly you know you 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 really are thinking on the fly as you're like you said as you're moving around and composing yes. as you work and yeah i think a lot of photographers need to think of that when they're when they're when they're doing that that you don't have to be in that one spot you can move you don't have to you can bend over you can go high and go you know, low but. Yes, and that's important, not just going left and right, but also going a height to see because it will be, and then you line, for example, you have to watch that the roof of the car does not cross right. the horizon line, right? So it'll be breaking it. Um, so then you have to adjust vertically what is your position that's to right. fit yeah. into that. There's, lot, there's lots to take into account when, you, when you're when you shooting yeah. like that, and then you're dealing with weather changes and uh it only comes from experience the more you do yes and the yep. more you you have that little checklist in your mind i would uh -huh. think I, I mean painters are the same and right? if you're painting on landscape your, your little yeah. check marks is can i sit here a mile to the wind can i handle that and, and the True. way you, when you paint but you're right the the roof of that truck if it cut across the, the horizon line it changes it the, yes everything yeah. uh there's that stop spot it yeah. stops your eye from but i like i like the weather issue that's happening it's got a little tension that's happening in the image and you mm -hmm. know the grasses are you can feel them that they're 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 different colors of greens and ochres and stuff and even the sage is and it's moving about so it's very it's very painterly uh, actually as well it's uh, uh in the textures beautiful and it it's a learning process too like when you come home and look at the images you analyze and see what worked and what didn't work, right? So yeah. that is the same way with, with film and digital. I When I go home, I if I have two or three good images from the roll of 36, I was very happy. But I look, I actually took notes when I was learning. I took notes what I was doing. What is the aperture? What is the lens? What right. is the shutter speed? And then learn what is working and what is not yeah the notebook's a good idea and I, I know i don't do as much i write a little bit of stuff in my sketchbook if i do a little sketch 
pre doing the painting, you write a few little notes to self, but yeah, I think it's a really good idea to take that little sketchbook or that little notebook with you when you go. Yeah. So this one's a really interesting. This is really a minimalist piece. Like you really, there's lots in there, the information, but it's a minimalist yeah. piece. It is. Yeah. It was uh, Prince Edward Island. Um, again, twilight, the color, but as I said, with photography, you remove things to make really the basic elements there, right? You don't try to cram too much into it. You actually yeah. try to remove things out to the essential elements. Yeah. No, this is lovely. The sky touching the water is, uh, you know, and they're of the same, get a little bit more color in the sky, but they're, they're of yeah. the same values. They, they have that. It's very, very subtle. It's uh, very, very, like I said, very uh, serene piece of work. The waves are minimal. There's the water, but it still has texture. So you, yeah. Yeah. no, just we're zinging along here. We got we got lots to see here yet. These, okay, these... this is again twilight uh, after sunset when you have, there's no light on the landscape, but the lights is reflecting from the clouds. And because of the filtering of the cool colors, you get this uh, reddish and orange color. Here, I did compose, um, I really like that simple landscape with a, with a, a bunch of tr aspen trees. This is on the road to uh, bigger. I know that spot. It's um, it's a, a, a quite. I go there often, and I noticed that a cloud moving in. So I set up my composition, set up my camera on a tripod, and just waited for the cloud to move in. And then I took a picture with with um, that composition here. Yeah, no, that little clump of trees in the uh, you know sandwiched between the the two waves of crop. Is, is, is a beautiful that little it's probably one of them little rock islands is what it is probably where there's yes, a rock yeah, it's really it's really farm, interesting there. farm around it but the crop the green crop is uh is beautiful probably a wheat or yep. something that's growing there but i love i love that wispy cloud that looks like you just painted it in with a brush you know you just yeah quickly well and then yeah. again you have this contrasting you have a green and mm. uh red right or or this uh, well again, the bottom, very contrasting yeah. sorry the bottom section is very um pristine and it is solid and determined in other words it's predetermined the bottom part the sky comes in and destroys the the predetermined full image it creates a freer looking image they're, they're complementary the the the, well, loose, it, the looseness in the sky and the tightness in the foreground you know and hmm. it's beautiful it's beautiful when you can put that opportunity together because it doesn't happen all the time like you you have to watch for it like you said you set your yeah. tripod up and you waited for the cloud to move in yeah um, and you can be there dozens of times and it just doesn't click a different cloud every time i know yes yeah <laughs> well and that's true too you get a cumulus cloud which will give you a completely different feeling than this cloud relative to the weather situation so you have to take advantage of what's what's in front of you at that moment i guess yeah yeah it's a uh, we move into some other things here. These are, um, are they a Saskatoon berry? Uh, no, this no. is soap cherry. It's soap cherry. Yeah. yeah. These so that was in Green Lake Provincial Park. And yeah, for years I've been taking like uh, narrow aperture sharp photographs from the foreground to the background. Oh. You know what they say, F16 and be there or F8, whatever they say. But I'm trying experimenting more with taking pictures with the wide apertures. You have this really blurred background, very soft. So I just, this is, I um, think was done with 135 millimeter lens at aperture 1.8 or F2. So really very shallow depth of field. And I lined up those berries. They'll be in the same plane of focus. So they're relatively sharp but then the background is blurred, right? Yeah. So I did move my camera left and right a little bit until I got this composition to have the tree, which is blurred. You don't see it, it's not sharp, yeah. but sharp enough yeah. to recognize the shape of a tree. So trying to get something new with maybe wide aperture rather than have everything in the focus. If you do this image with everything in the focus, it would be boring. Yeah. 
No, nope, very true. It had that gray adds a nice little neutral in your in your piece as well. Like not everything is just green and orange and, and yes, berry, right. Yep. So, but again, in the let's just talk quick design. I mean, here you have a branch that's touching all four edges of your your picture frame. It's 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 secured to the bottom, left, right, and top of the page, and it's a, a nice balance between the berries. You know, there's that there's a little tinkling of berries on the top and down on the right. So. It's a nice, it's like you said, It you work with what you've got at the moment and it's just trying to think, you're kind of shooting on the fly, but you're still figuring yeah. out how to, how do I make that exciting, you know? And it's, but, uh, yeah, yeah, you have to be aware of that, how you frame it, right? So is it touching or you have to leave a little bit of space around to breathe. So right. you have to, it's good that you mentioned that. You have to really watch how you frame your image. And then sometimes you get a branch protruding, I would remove it branch. If there is a branch, for example, in the top right corner, yeah. that is not fitting there, I would remove it. Yeah. This one, this one, I looked at it and thought, this is so different than all the other pictures you sent me. And I just, okay, we'll put this one in. Is this the wing of an airplane or is this, are we looking up at some solar No, panels? it's in, in the new airport in Zagreb, Croatia. I was waiting for my brother and I noticed that, again, it's contrast between warm and cold colors. But I really like that smooth wave on the roof structure that I yeah. took a picture of. So, so what? Is, so it's part of the roof structure is what you're looking at. It is, yeah. It's a it's a waiting area where it's an arrival area. You wait for somebody to pick you up or a cab, and just a roof structure. Oh, yeah. this is the it's under part. the under part of the roof. Under part uh, of the roof. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. No, it's very. I I like it because of the 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 diminishing lines that are taking you away one direction. The sky is going in the other direction. Yeah. Uh, and the colors, you're right. The colors just pop. It's just, yeah. it's an interesting image, and I just, I love the abstractness of it. And uh, and it's and a parking it's lot. <laughs> In a parking lot. It's a parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. This is a lovely piece. Yeah. This is. This is love. I mean, anybody who lives in Saskatchewan has probably, if they've traveled around a bit, have seen this. Anybody in the prairies, you've seen similar things to these. Color doesn't last real long. Um, it pops up one day, it's really bright, and a good wind comes along and it's gone. So, yeah, yeah these are this one. Yeah, is, is this in the Koshin area or is this? No, North? this is um, north edge of Buffalo Lake. It is Nature oh. Conservancy property. Um, in early spring, just the leaves are just coming out and very gentle. So, you have maybe similar situation that you have in the fall, variety of colors. But they're much softer. Right? They're yeah. not as harsh as in the call. And then again, playing with the structure, the uh, texture of the terrain. But what interested me there was that really very soft and gentle colors and texture of a newly emerging leaves. That was taken maybe half an hour before sunset. Yeah. No, the, the and the the hills are just beautiful. The way they they pull in behind the imagery and. They, they offer a really nice background uh, for the presence of the, I guess, the tiering of the foliage in the foreground from low height to, and then you can still see through the trees and some of the other ones and still see that ghosted um, hill in the background going left to right that pulls in between. You can almost draw the line where it goes through and finishes on the right side. So it, it kind of goes down from left to right in behind those first bluff of trees. The little little nuances like that that excite your eye because your eye wants to connect things and uh this is this, this is definitely one of those pieces this is a partner if you just go back a little bit oh sure yeah. yeah just go back here again in terms of framing if you look it is a panorama combined of two or three images and when i created the final print you see the trees uh, on the left and the right, right? So when you create a panorama, you need to have anchors on each side. So you see, I use those trees on the left and right as an anchor. So your eye does not flow and escape out of the frame, right? So, and then yeah. you allow it kind of a similar amount of space between the trees, anchors, and the edge of the frame. So oh. Think about that when you um, take a panorama shot. You need to anchor it somehow because 
if it is just going and suddenly disappearing, you feel lost. Your eye just kind of escapes, runs away. You do try to move it back and put it in your socket. I think I think the green that circles around and comes around that bluff of trees and then is picked up again in the foreground kind of brings your eye back into the picture as well. So, you know, you the lower vegetation is really working for you as well on that one. Yeah, it's beautiful. And this one is beautiful, very beautiful little piece. Uh, the flower is just, I, I don't know what, it's a wildflower of some kind, but I'm not. It is a wildflower, three flowered avens. They come up in the spring and then they kind of uh, um, dry out in later June. It is again, portrait of a natural environment. And then again, if you try to learn photography, when micro photography, they say, oh, you have everything in a sharp focus, right? No, try to take pictures of micro subject with a wide aperture. Um, so you get this blur background and it's same as a portrait. Think about this as a portrait. It is. Yeah. What do portrait photographers do? They take a short telephoto lens, let's say 85 or 135 millimeters, and they use wide aperture to blur the background. It's exactly the same thing here. Um, again, contrast between warm and cold, red and green, um, the bring element out there. And for the advice of photographers, it is really difficult in the field to have that sense how much separation you manage to accomplish. So what I do, I will take the same image with different aperture values. And then later on, this, on the TV screen, on my computer screen, I would pick the best one because you really do not know what is going to turn out because your screen is small and you don't see it. Right. And as you said, with a digital, we can experiment more. Don't be afraid to experiment. Then you'll get the image that you like. And your feelings change. You can look at this image today and you can look at it three months later and maybe another version would fit better, right? So it's right. really very emotional so, how we perceive the images. So do you give workshops for other photographers? And I do what? photography workshops. Yeah, there's a little bit of pause now with the COVID, but I'm starting to come up back again. Yeah, yeah. and you do and you do travel trips as well um, back to your home country, of course. Yeah, I do now. Like I take a group of people between 12 to 15 people and then we spend two weeks in Croatia. Wow. We eat a lot of good food, drink a lot of wine <laughs> and occasionally we take some pictures. Oh, you take some great pictures, actually. I, Thank I've, you. I've known a couple of people that have gone on those trips with you. And uh, if any are uh, if it's all every on anybody's bucket list, you should do uh, uh, do that. And Brandemir, Brandemir is a great host um, at those oh, yeah. adventures, and he'll make sure that you'll find the magic spots there. And I can't believe Croatia is just some of the stuff that I've seen. And just like yes, it's in, very uh, diverse in a small space. Yeah, it's a fantasy land in itself. What is it? What's going on in this one? This one. So this here one? is again panorama. Saw the similar pictures. It was done in Italy um uh, early spring what again what attracted me here those splashes of color uh yeah. you have really beautiful this kind of a pink and the light green the olive trees early spring and what attracted me here are shapes you have this spots little olive young olive trees that are dotting the landscape and vertical vertical trees they're kind of breaking that up so what attracted me combination of shapes and combination of color. So you're on a hill or are you in a building? I'm on a hill looking down, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we don't have trees like that here. I knew that wasn't in Canada as much. No, no, this was Italy. <laughs> Beautiful piece of country. Anyway, this is this is Brandon Ear's book. He still has available. And uh, I think I've seen it a few times in the bookstore. And I do, in this is a, uh, in conjunction with Trevor Harriet, who's a, a birder, yeah. I guess, in Saskatchewan and well known and well written about and has a number yeah. of books out as well. And uh, Brandon Muir has links to all these images that he's got. Plus, you know what? He's got way more, way more than what we sh showed today. He selectively chose some things today for this for this uh, talk. And I appreciate that. But um, 
No, oh, there he is. He's back. And I'm back. <laughs> uh, so I'm like I'm like a bad cold. I just come back. Brand new, you're like the gorgeous cat. stuff. You're like a I'm cat. Like a, um, you can't well, it depends back. if you like it, if you like pussy. But anyway, um, I what you call? I love your stuff. It's bright. It's vibrant. It's colorful. It almost looks like it's not real. That's I. But I enjoyed it tremendously. So here's my question, and Paul knows what I ask everybody. If somebody wants to purchase your artwork or your photography, what's it start at from where to where? Dollar well, it is, Paul put my website, website address over there, brandemirfoto.ca. I'll put it, it, I'm going to put it below so people can below, go. Yeah, but, below. If people are, so, but if people uh, are listening to this on a podcast. Yeah, I don't it. have frame prints. I kind of learned hard way, a lot of unsold inventory. Right. So if you want to print, then I will print for you and then we can um ship it anywhere you want and then you okay. will have to frame it right i don't have a right, control. how much how is it for me to buy a print from you yes you can buy the print there's a gallery but for how much how much does it oh, cost? oh for you uh, it's priceless yeah dollars it's priceless. yeah 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 it's yeah. priceless no it depends on the size right so okay. we can depends on the size and then add shipping to it it's not i don't charge a lot it's um i okay. know my images are absolutely priceless i mean it's doesn't matter sure. how much you pay but but you got to yeah. put a price on it so if i someone says to me tomorrow they see the show they go i love this guy how much does he charge for one of his photos what do i tell them between five canadian to 100 canadian is it what's the price range well that would be yeah it wouldn't be five it would not be okay. five lower end there is a minimum even for a small one, people ask me why the small eight by ten image is so costly. Because it's yeah. my time. I have right, no, but how much is it? How much is one? I'm gonna get a number from you if it kills me. I don't, you're so, not going to get a number. No, you're not going to okay. get a number. It really depends. So it's on somewhere size. between a dollar. It. So it's a know. dollar. Get in touch. Get in touch with me, and we'll talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Uh, right. think so about somewhere it, between the large million. part of the cost will yeah. be framed. Right? right, right. Well, that's yeah, their responsibility just, because just, you're not framing. You're going to roll it up and send it to them. In yeah, a no, I send it. So, yeah. I mean, when you purchase the print, think that you have to add the cost of the frame. That could be kind of unpleasant surprise. So, uh, yeah, the frames don't. You know what? We got a guy that knows a guy that knew another guy. Something. Fell oh, off the truck. okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. In yeah. terms of in terms of price and the cost, yeah. it is unbelievable value for what you get. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's gorgeous stuff. And since you won't tell us how much it is, it's priceless. So everybody yeah. should run out and go buy one or two. Um, yeah. Your link will be below so people can yes. find you um yeah. and then that's it and my friend it, it was a pleasure meeting you and looking at your work and will your show is coming out so there you go well thank you yeah. guys appreciate it. and well. thanks Bradamir, for like a great conversation great knowledge today lots of photo information people want to know the prices contact uh Bradamir. yeah Definitely. contact us or contact the website below and yeah. we'll see everybody next thursday yeah i'll see you then cheers everybody sounds good thank you